I needed new hair today, so I'm still looking for that filter. Well, at least you have hair. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> Blessing. You Thank do you too. Jesus. Yeah, yeah you do. You got some hair. Got lots I, of hair. I like. Yeah, I, I don't have a forehead though. I have a five head. Yeah, I got I got those genetics myself actually. Okay, so we're gonna start this up. I see the la the recordings on, so I'll just start this up. All right. Thank you so much, Rob, for being here today. We are so excited about this conversation. Pastor Rob McCoy, I've had the pleasure of being with you in a couple different spaces live and listening to you. And I have appreciated your stance on many different levels, many different topics. The one that we talked about recently, or you talked about recently was this, uh, you know, how are we going to come together? as churches, how is the largest army on the earth, the church going to have an awakening and then a unity when we're kind of worried about these, these other things. And I've heard you use this phrase tertiary topics. So yeah. can you expand on this? What, what is, what is your hope for the church? Maybe what's the problem? What are we seeing? What do we need to move in on? I'd love for everybody to hear this. Cause I've heard you talk about, it and it's really powerful. Wow. You're, you're, you're kind. Thank you to both you ladies, and it's a joy to be with you. And I just have to say, Jenny, when I when I hear you speak, especially when we were in that conference, the Ecclesia co Conference in Las Vegas, and I remember we were on a panel, and they're they're you're talking, and I just felt like I was a member of the audience. And then they asked me a question; I didn't realize I was supposed to do something. I what what God is doing with with you and all the ladies involved in this, and all the volunteers across the country, um, is something. Sorry something my heart has been longing for for a long time that that the moms of america would awaken and uh, god has chosen you guys and it's it's evident and i've never been more more moved i would say with what god's doing it's it's profound and and you you had asked about the church the church is usually late to the game uh, her her people the the congregations they're the ones that kind of started a, a, apart from the shepherds um, shepherds believe that peace is the absence of conflict and, and they don't want to make waves, but peace isn't the absence of conflict. Peace is the presence of Christ in the midst of the conflict. Jesus said, I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. We're to contend in culture for the welfare of our neighbors and for our family. You know, as the scripture says to have one of these little ones stumble, it'd be better for you to have a millstone tied around your neck and cast in the deepest ocean. And, and so the church's responsibility is to awaken the congregation to its responsibility for not only to provide for our families, because he who doesn't provide for his family is left less than an infidel. And that means even protection, but, but also to love your neighbors yourself. We're to do good. We're to care for our neighbors and their children who are being mutilated and, and all the things that are happening through the alphabet mafia across the country. And, and, you, you're standing, all you ladies are standing and, and the, the men are standing and it's just a, a, a powerful move. And what's happening is you're, it's, it's Romans, I believe 11 or yeah, Romans 11, that you're provoking uh, others to jealousy, that they, they want to be about what God's doing. Um, and, and, and people want to be a part of it. They just don't know how to do it. And when they see somebody doing it, they're inspired to join in. And so that's what's happening with this movement. Now the church, we tend to to divide and we tend to focus on what, what you asked me to repeat, which was tertiary issues. Yeah. And, and all that simply means is there are basic tenets of the Christian faith that unify us as orthodox, orthodoxy, meaning, you know, the deity of Christ, the Trinity, the, the inerrancy of scripture, uh, all, all of these are, are main tenets of the Christian faith for orthodoxy. Tertiary issues are theological positions that we can hold that someone else may not have. For example, eschatology, which is a study of the end times. Uh, I'm pre-trib, pre-millennial. Others could be all millennial, post-millennial. And, and yet they, they're still Christians, they're still Orthodox because it's a tertiary issue. Um, and so, so these tertiary issues are not something we should be dividing over, although denominations have been a set up throughout the country because people have divided over these secondary theological positions. And now it, we, we say, well, we're non-denominational. And that's what I'm part of a affiliation of churches called Calvary Chapel. And we say we're non-denominational. We don't send money to a central uh, location. We don't have seminaries that are supported by all the churches. Uh, instead, each church is basically independently owned and operated. 
uh, but we hold to a, a basic tenets of what we call uh, the Calvary distinctives. Uh, so so non-denominational used to be the hip term, but now it's going beyond that. It's called post-denominationalism. If, mm -hmm. if, we, if, if we don't unify, we see in, in the body of Christ, religious liberty is under attack. Evil is, is proudly portraying itself and, and fervently attacking any vestige of the presence of Christ. And the church does not have the luxury of division over tertiary issues. Mm -hmm. We must step into an age of post-denominationalism, which means it's not just non-denominationalism, it's post-denominationalism, where you come into a church, you say, I love the expositional teaching and the love for God's word, and the, and the, 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 the worship isn't maybe my style, but it's tertiary. Uh, they, they have organs and pianos or, or you know, a cappella, or they have syncopated rhythms. I'm still gonna that that's that's a post-denominational issue. I'm not gonna let that affect me. I'm I'm seeking the fellowship with one another and to stand on behalf of our community and our neighbors that we wouldn't divide over these things because the church the, we're under attack and we cannot divide over this. The Bible says, endeavor, endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Mm -hmm. if, if we don't stand together, we're gonna fall apart. And that's mm -hmm. That's the idea. That's it. I've seen you almost be a person, not almost, you are a person that God has used as like a rally cry. Like, hey guys, let's look at the important issues that could destroy us yeah. and um, not put so much emphasis on, like you said, the tertiary issues. And I, I appreciate this conversation a ton. Okay, moving to, I I, I feel like we, we have to insert this in okay. this conversation, but what happened when you did not shut your church down? You were one of the people who decided to stand and not go along to get along, and you kept your church open. And I'm sure you got so much wonderful feedback from all sorts of people. Can you tell us about that and what, what kind of happened through that? Yeah. But ultimately, you know, I think we want that impartation, that strength, and that resolve that you had, that's a resolve that we're going to need for the days to come and even right now. Well, I'm, I, I'm, I'm grateful that you, again, tee up such a, a kind request, but that's coming from, we're, we're both citizens of not just the West Coast, the left coast. Mm -hmm. uh, California, where I reside, Oregon, where you're from, um, th th these are states that have just been enveloped by tyranny. And as you know, during COVID, the governors of Washington, Oregon, California, they they exercised ruthless tyranny over the citizenry, especially those who believe the first 16 words of the very first amendment of the 28 amendments to our U.S. Constitution, the very first amendment of the 10, which is considered the Bill of Rights. And those first 16 words, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion, nor prohibiting the free exercise thereof. The governors are powerful, but they do not and never will have the right to tell the church that it is non-essential. Mm -hmm. Now, look, we were all faced with consequences of standing in opposition to the decrees and the tyrannical decrees of these governors and sheriffs and county supervisors and city councils and school boards where they began to tell us that, you know, with medical apartheid, if you don't take this experimental mRNA and we're going to shame you into getting it, we're going to take away your ability and your livelihood. We're going to shutter your business and tell you that it's non-essential. And the churches had separate approaches to it. Uh, many said, well, it's, 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 you need to take the shot and you need to remain closed because that's the loving thing to do. Yeah, no, it's not. In love, love is not avoiding conflict. Love is standing right. for truth. Come on. And and so, you know, in in the absence, in the absence of courage, truth is an orphan. And so we were looking. Where, where are the people standing for the reality that they don't wow. have the right to? The church was open during the bubonic plague, for goodness sakes. And, and we we knew the severity of the virus. We knew all these things, and they're shuttering businesses. And so. It just, it came to the point where I didn't need to be a doctor. I, I, I didn't need to be uh, a, a molecular or a cellular biologist. I, I, just, I just knew the governor doesn't have the right 
to tell the bride of Christ mm -hmm. that it's non-essential. Come on. The, the, the church is the bride of Christ. Governor, you, 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 you have a lot of authority, and we are to respect those in positions of authority. Romans 13. And I'd hear this from pastors. You're disobeying Romans 13. And I'd say, have you read the passage? It says, God appoints all positions of authority and that we're to submit to that because they're there for, and this is critical, they're there. Jonathan Mayhew, is, it was the, the, the East Coast uh, pastor who exegeted this text prior to the War of Independence and inspired John Adams and all the founding fathers when he pointed out that the text says that they are there for our good. And when they cease to do good, they cease to be the authority. There's, it's not unlimited submission to tyranny. Come on. Mm -hmm. you, you, you know, you're, you're not allowed to beat your children and your children are not to submit to you because you're the dad. Right. That's right. That's, right. That's, that's wrong. And no, you are not allowed to abuse your wife. You're not allowed to abuse your children. And they are not required to submit to that. That's tyranny. Right. And they're not doing good. And, and, and this is the idea that pastors all of a sudden thought unlimited submission to tyrannical authority that's, in, that's causing their neighbors to suffer. In California, our elderly were dying alone. Who does that? The abused were quarantined with their wow. abusers. Who does that? Right. Where's the love? The love required courage. In the absence of courage, the truth was an orphan. And, and these pastors didn't stand. I thought that they would. I was shocked that so few did. And the ones that did, you know, the, the, you, you think, oh, they're definitely going to stand. And you, the ones you thought would didn't. And the ones you didn't think would did. <laughs> and it was it was exciting to to see how God kind of shook up the the body of Christ and 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 now since then some that didn't stand have come around and that's great you know we we may we may fail but forgetting what is behind striving for what is ahead take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of you God's in the business of you know when when we're honest with Him He's merciful with us and those pastors came on board bless their heart but the ones that have doubled down be, because that they're they 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 think they're going to get some sort of an honor from those in authority with fear of man is a snare. Come on. And, and I, I would say to people when we travel the country, did you take the shot because you believed in its efficacy? Right. Or did you take it because you were afraid of losing your job or not getting to see your grandkids? There you go. That's right. And if, if the second portion of the latter is your answer, that's fear of man. That's, that's fear right. of man. You know, the, the, the Lord says that your body is a temple of the Holy spirit. So, when, when you're saying the courage to stand, the courage was just simply, I'm not in charge of the outcome. Mm -hmm. And we had people said, if I stand on this, they were, they were airline pilots, they were paramedics, they were firemen, they were police officers. If I make this stand, I'm going to lose my job. Mm. And I said, that's, that's, that's you before the Lord. Everyone, it, 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 each one is, is, is given a measure of faith. But the question is, this is about you? Or is it about generations to come? Exactly. Because we're not in charge of the outcome. Yes, the likelihood is you're probably going to lose your job. You're, you're going to be removed from military service. You're, you're going to be ostracized. You're going to probably lose financial standing. That, yeah. that, that's, that's probably the case. But we're not in charge of the outcome. We are in charge of the obedience. Mm -hmm. And he right. who knows the good to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. I was not prepared to embrace sin because I was afraid of man. That's right. right. Come on. The church is the bride of Christ. It is essential and she will always be essential. And, and that's it. Any, any shepherd doesn't, you know, if, if you are following the scriptures, that's a no brainer. And, and you cannot use Romans 13, which was, by the way, the most off quoted verse in Nazi Germany to get all of the, the pastors to, su to submit to national socialism. Oh, we're, we're to submit to all positions of authority. Now, it's not unlimited submission to tyranny. You're, you're taking that verse to, to justify your apathy and inactivity. That's right. And so that's what we did. Yeah. We, did, we didn't know what was going to happen. I was brought before the judge on contempt charges. We were fined $3,000 a day every day. $3,000 every time the doors of the church were open. They documented over $300,000 in fines, threatened with jail. Um, it, was, it, was, it was scary times, and we were all scared. We were all scared. It's really interesting, too, because, you know, whether it be your situation as a pastor who has to make the decision to face every problem that comes with doing what you feel is right, 
And then I, I think about just individuals facing like, well, I could lose my job, right? And my assistant, she lost her job as a nurse at a local hospital. And I said, good, I'll take you. Because her skill set was like, I need you really, really bad. And now she's just rocking this thing, right? Like the wheels are staying on the wagon now that she's on board with this. But my point is this, is that whether it's Jessica as my assistant or whether it's you who's responsible for a congregation and all the decisions and all the consequences that come with that, it comes down in my, in my mind, in my heart, it comes down to this. Do you trust that God will take care of you? Maybe in a different way, maybe not in the way that you want, whatever. But at the end of the day, it's like, okay, you lose your job. Is God not able Come on. to back you up when you do the right thing? Now, if someone's an unbeliever, fine, you get a hall pass, you know, like mm -hmm. you get a pass on being afraid of everything. You know, I get it. You got to be spooked by everything if you don't trust God. But when you're a believer, like, isn't this like the reason we're Christians is because we trust God and we are, our life is not our own. And so we make dis decisions that go, well, this will be interesting how this turns out. Yeah. And we don't love our life unto death, you know? So mm -hmm. anyway, it just, it, it makes sense to me that you just do the right thing and see how God is going to come along and back you up, you know? So anyway, that's my little soapbox for the moment, but. Um, well, well, wait, wait, you, you're not going to just be able to say that and just walk away from it. But, <laughs> and, you know, any, Jenny, anything given to, to God first will never be lost. And, and the pastors that were trying to get us to fall in line, they said, you're hindering the preaching of the gospel. I said, what kind of a gospel hides the truth? That's myopic and truncated. It's narrow in the sense that not, not narrow in truth. It's, it's, it's removing truth in order to somehow find favor with man. And, and I, I, I just said, did you, you know, I tell pastors this. They, they said, you know, you, your, your budget, your giving's going to drop. People are going to leave the church. The church exploded. We grew, we grew 400% in 16 months. In, in, in 24 months, we had baptized twice as many people as the attendance of the church was 24 months earlier. And, and these were agnostics, atheists, Mormons, Jews. These were folks whose businesses we defended. And, and they, they were seeking truth. And they weren't finding it, the churches that were shuttered, and saying, come and fellowship online. Watching, watching church online is like watching a fireplace. You can hear it <laughs> and see it, but you can't feel the warmth. I you don't forsake that. fellowshipping with the saints. Come on in. We're, it's 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 a uh, it's immunity by community, and they loved it. And so, yeah, yeah, we saw people like not just migrate, but like run. Oh, to absolutely. Places where people were standing up. If you if you were yeah. standing for truth in that time, you were winning because yeah. people. And I learned this in business, and I learned this through being a mother. I just learned this in life. Is that people act are actually looking for people of courage, resolve, strength. It's actually how my husband and I, on our first date, he did not know the gospel. And I said, what? You've not heard the gospel and you, you, you're an American? And I was like, well, here's the deal. I'm a radical Jesus lover. This is what happened. This is what happened. And, and you know, like it or not. And that's as far as this relationship's going to go. He left there going, this woman. And he said, he goes, Jenny, I could not say no to somebody with that much resolve. And I was so curious. I had to ask you out again, which then, you know, the next conversation was about heaven and hell. We just had to get through the stuff, you know? And um, he just, it was that type of resolve that actually attracted mm -hmm. him to want to get to know me more, even though he said, man, I was, I didn't know what to do with Jesus after all this, but he figured it out. <laughs> he gave his life to the Lord. But I just want to encourage people out there, grab a hold of what Pastor Rob is saying, grab a hold of not just the content of what he's saying, mm -hmm. but the resolve, the strength, the, the, like I've drawn a line, not in the sand, but in the concrete, Yeah, like this thing, this thing's permanent. I am not going to back down. And I sense that I've always felt this way. You probably have too, is that we, we went through a practice run with COVID. We went yeah. through yeah. this uh, dress rehearsal. I can't say that I passed it with flying colors. I, I can't. Mm -hmm. I, I remember thinking, do I walk into the store and without my mask and just face <laughs> that 10 people waiting to tell me, you know, that you got to get her. I mean, I, I'm, it was like, how much, you know, do I want to go through today, going through this door? I don't know. But I do know this is that um, we're going to need to be stronger than ever. Mm -hmm. We're going to need to stand up for those who are being attacked. And so let's talk about that, Pastor Rob. You've said this, silence equals consent. So as we are watching our children 
be just, you know, indoctrinated into this crazy, you know, this cross sex hormones, the puberty blockers, the mutilation of their genitals and just crazy stuff. As we are watching this and we're like, well, I don't know that kid. That's not my granddaughter. Mm -hmm. That's not my child. Okay. What are we going to do? The ones who are seeing this happen. And I guess there's a loaded question. I just want you to take us down this track of silence equals consent. Yeah. They attribute to Dietrich Bonhoeffer, um, silence in the face of evil is complicit with evil itself. Although we've, we've never found exactly where he stated that, but it, it fits all of his writings. But we do see it very clearly in scripture, Leviticus 20, uh, when, when members of Israel or, or God's people are sacrificing to Molech. And God says, you're, you're going to be destroyed. You don't sacrifice your children to idols. And then he goes further to say in verse 4 of, of chapter 20, if, if you see someone sacrificing their children to Molech, and you say nothing and do nothing, and you don't stop them, I will treat you exactly the way I'm going to, to come after them. You'll, you'll be under the same judgment. Mm. You, you're, you're consenting to the evil by your silence. And you, you, you think that you're being loving by being silent. Hello, Christian. There's two genders. It's not loving to, to be silent with folks that are having mental breakdowns and, and you're, 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 laying a pathway for them to go deeper into that abyss and allowing them to mutilate their bodies. I mean, Chloe Cole at 15 with a double mastectomy, where were the adults in the room? Exactly. 20 years from now, if, if you're silent, 20 years from now, this generation is going to look and ask you from their mutilated bodies, where were you? Can, can right. you imagine all the Germans after World War II? And, and the world is looking at them and the shame upon that nation as they were saying, why didn't you say something? Mm -hmm. because, because you were afraid of the authorities? Fear of man is a snare. Yeah, we, one of the, I, I brought this, Jenny, I, and I, I get no benefit from it. I have no dog in this fight. It has just blessed me. He, he's, he's not a you know, New York Times bestselling author, but you can find his books online. His name's Bill Federer. I love this guy. You should have him speak. We interviewed him. We did. Yeah. We interviewed him. Tell us all about this because it made me think of this. This is it. Silence. <laughs> silence equals consent. He breaks it down. The sin of omission. He breaks it down with every passage. And then he goes through history. Uh, he does John Calvin. He walks through, uh, obviously, Martin Niemöller, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And, and he's, he's just such a good writer. Everything is connected. Um, and, and, it, and when you're finished, you just have a working knowledge of it. I'd encourage folks, you know, leaders read and readers lead. Uh, and, and faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of God. But, but whatever's true, whatever's noble, whatever's pure, meditate on these things. Find stuff that can prepare you to communicate to, to the world around you. Uh, and that's what Bill does so well. So uh, just, just back to that, we, 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 can't, we can't be silent. We're the only creatures in all of God's creation that have been given the ability to speak wow. spoken word. Good point. And that word brings life and the absence of it speaking in the midst of death is consenting to that death. Speak. Mm, wow. Rob, what do you, what would you say is, is it fear of man? Is that, is that the, the thing that causes silence? Is that what it is? Do you feel like that's the big kind of the big daddy or is, is there other things that you've seen even in that maybe that book talks about like what is motivating someone who says they're a believer? Yeah. Not only that, but they they they're standing in front of congregation. Some of them want, saying that they're leading these people and yet they're being silent about these things. <laughs> You guys have obviously been doing this a while because every cool question is outstanding. Um, yeah, it's, it's, we're in, we're in a day and age with social media where you know we want to be liked, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, standing for truth is is you're not going to be liked, uh, especially if it's not if it's not the popular position. Mm -hmm. um, and and I would I would say that. You know, this idea of fear of man is a snare. Yes, yes, it is ruling authorities that have the ability to enforce consequences. So people say it was Adolf Hitler and all of his victims. No, it wasn't. 
No, it wasn't. It was Adolf Hitler and a compliant nation that agreed to lie to themselves, wow. to each other, to their friends, their neighbors, their coworkers, because they were too afraid, and pay attention to this, they were too afraid of the consequences of telling the truth. The, the White Rose Rebellion with Sophie, I can't remember her last name, she, oh. she stood in the midst of Nazi Germany and she was brutally murdered by, by the authorities. But I'll tell you what, it's appointed once for a man to die, then judgment. You'll stand before God and give an accounting of your life. And that young lady, she didn't die. She may have suffered temporarily, but she she ex exhaled her last breath on earth and, and inhaled her first breath in heaven. And I'll tell you what, she was overjoyed, just overwhelmed with gratitude that the Lord would consider her worthy to suffer on that in that mm. regard in, in the in the the center of, of concentrated evil of the time. You you stand for truth. It, it, that's God's looking for, for folks that are willing to they they they, they love the truth more than their own lives. Mm -hmm. And, and it's and it's for generations to come. Don't don't be Hezekiah's where you go, well, you know, at least there's 15 years of peace in my time. A nation grows great whose whose elderly plant trees of the shade they'll never know, so that generations to come may enjoy them. Mm. You don't live for yourself. This was this was the only generation in America where we shuttered children's schools. And they had a 0.00002% chance of death. We shuttered their schools. We, we, we limited their, their ability to speak as we muzzled them. They have speech impediments and all kinds of issues now. Their education has, has been reversed. They're, they're, they're far behind others that have had the schooling from day one. And why did we do that? Because we wanted to keep grandma and grandpa alive like Hezekiah for another 15 years. So we ruined their future so that so that we could enjoy more time in sunny, you know, Arizona or whatever it is, playing more golf. No, the, the, the older takes care of the younger. We provide for the generations to come. That's what we've always done. Yeah. And and that we gotta. We got to get back to that. But yeah, when people, I people are afraid and they're selfish. Yeah. yeah, when I saw the masks go on the kids, I'll never forget how I felt about that. I went, "We're in, we're in deep trouble." Yeah. If you send a kid to school and say you're going to put this on your face for six to seven hours a day, you are teaching a child that you're going to be ashamed of this thing. Yeah. And now we have kids at that age group that even when they smile or whatever, they'll they'll automatically put their hand up because they have they don't have confidence in their smile, they don't have confidence in their voice. And I knew that. I said that's gonna happen. And in the Hebrew calendar, it's the decade of the mouth. We're in the decade of the mouth speaking. And so even more now, to tell the truth, you're gonna be a leader <laughs> in the whole deal. You know, I was listening to the sales guy the other day. And uh, they said, you know, right now, as a salesperson, if you're in business, if you just tell the truth, you're going to stick out. That's right. Because people are lying. They're doing fake testimonies. They're doing ridiculous things on Instagram. I see these ads and I just laugh, you know. But if you just tell the truth, maybe that's the new popular trend, you know, going back to our ancient roads, the ancient roots of just telling the truth. I think you said the word truth gobs of times in this conversation. You've said it over and over and over again. It keeps coming out of you, Pastor Rob. And so that is what I want to anchor this conversation on as people are listening and they're saying, okay, what am I grabbing here? It's maybe we separate ourselves from this evil. We separate ourselves from the tyranny. We separate ourselves from um, the silence, right? By telling the truth at all costs. And it will cost us. Amen. But you know what? The cost of joining the rest of the lies and the deception is a cost that could cost us eternity. And I'm not willing to mess with that. I'll tell you that right now. So do you have any last minute thoughts? What, what are you thinking at this point that you could share with our audience? And we're going to, we're going to have you pray when we, um, when we end this conversation, but what else, what else do you got? I did have oh, something, have Rob. Okay. I, yeah. I, I want you to touch on something. And then if you have other thoughts in addition to this, I'd love to hear it too. 
But I just wanted to touch on, because you brought up before we hopped on here live, you you touched on the turning point in the conference with the women. Yeah. And I just think that that I feel like that's such a hopeful thing. Like the energy you felt there, the standing room only, like, you know, we're talking yeah, about people about standing for truth. We're talking about people who are standing up and and things are turning. Things are people are getting excited. People are wanting something to believe in. And there's places to find it. And so I'd love you to touch on that. Oh, it'd be a, a joy. Um, Winston Churchill said the man, his quote was, the man was cursed to have been born in uninteresting times. <laughs> That's not true for us. We, we, we are alive for the most critical moment in the, in the Republic's history. A nation conceived in liberty and dedicated the proposition that all men are created equal, as, as Lincoln said, will not perish from the face of the earth, but have a new birth of freedom. And no other nation in the history of the world is like America. 4% of the world's population, yet it's had more patents and symphonies and Nobel Peace Prize winners. And you ride in an elevator, it was invented by an American. You fly in an airplane, it was invented by an American. You enjoy air conditioning, it was invented by an American. Even the internet was invented by an American, not Al Gore. And, and all of this, not because we, we have more resources, Canada has more natural resources, South America has more natural resources. It's, it's because America was given something. It was given freedom that we, we have the freedom to pursue the Lord. And, and if we seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, all these things will be added unto us. Blessed is a nation whose God is the Lord. And, and so we honor him in, in our birth certificate. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, endowed by their creator with inalienable rights. Life, without life, liberty is a waste of time. Life, the author of life is God. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, which is the highest virtue. The idea of happiness is if I have a glass in front of me, it's the highest virtue because it's a good glass because it's, it's doing that for which it was designed to do. It's holding fluid. If it's leaking, it's a bad glass. And, and the pursuit of happiness is a pursuit of that for which God designed you. It's not a feeling or an emotion. It's stepping into the realm of ministering to a community and watching these laws, the wise restraints that would make us free, free to, to flourish as we apply restraints towards evil and we pursue excellence like all athletes know. Then all of a sudden inventions occur in America flourishes around the world. And, and, and I, I say all this because we're, we're at a precip where we have men and women who consider themselves moral. Oh, I don't do that. I don't do that. And then they, they, they decry a, a, a previous president who was three times married and twice divorced. I could never vote for someone three times married and twice divorced. And he's probably slept with every woman in New York based on his, his own statements. And he's caustic in his tweets and X's or whatever. Okay. Well, take take Samson out of the Hall of Faith with that attitude. Because there's not one moral thing about yeah. Samson's life. He was in a prostitute's bed all night when the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. He went to go pay off a gambling debt and the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. He had a, he had a Nazarite vow. It, it prophesied from birth to deliver God's people. And, and he's in the hall of faith, and you're thinking his first words have it, it, got to be something significant. Nazarite vow prophesied to deliver God's people from the womb. And his first words out of his mouth is, Mom, Dad, go get that Philistine woman. I want her. He went off the reservation. There's, his life was a train wreck. Yet God put him in the hall of faith in Hebrews 11. Why? Yeah. Judges 14.4. What Samson's parents didn't realize is God was seeking an occasion to move against the Philistines. You know... We're not electing a pastor in chief. That's it. We're electing a commander in chief and a bodyguard of Western civilization. Yeah, he's got his issues, but so do you. And, and name one president in modern history who's done more for life than, than, than Donald Trump. Name one. Even Reagan pales in comparison to what he's done in religious liberty. And we talk about seven mountains sociologically. I'm, I'm, I'm not... Um, a dominionist. I, I look at these seven mountains of cultural influence and, and sociological influence. It, it doesn't matter. You know, I'm not applying it to a theology. I'm looking at it simply like this: arts and entertainment, media, business, education, politics, religion, and family. 
Those are things that move culture. Yeah. And, and so Samson, he had issues, but listen, he knew how to control or, or, or move an army. He knew how to fight. He knew how to rally people. And, and you look at Trump, he's got his issues, but arts and entertainment, uh, he had the number one television show in America. Media, he won the election with a Twitter account. Politics, he took out 17 Republican candidates and the most heavily funded Democrat candidate in the history of our country. I mean, and, and then you look at business. The Trump brand is world-renowned. Education and, and family. He's, yeah, three times married, twice divorced. His ex-wives love him. One's passed. His, his kids have all been successful in their own right. Religion, he's struggling. Two Corinthians, he's, he's, he's on a journey. But all of those things put together, you, 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 you want to apply moral pietism because you think your morality is, uh, exceeds his and it makes you feel better. I, I got news for you. All that's necessary for evil to prosper or triumph is for moral men and women, good men and women, to do nothing. He's in the arena, just like Samson was, contending to set people free. That's right. And all we can do is sit back and decry his, his immorality compared to your own. Well, good for you, but here, here's the problem. The difference between morality and character. Morality is not doing what's wrong. Don't drink, smoke, chew, hang around with those who do. You're, you're moral men and women. But character's different. Character, unlike morality, character isn't not doing what's wrong. Character is doing what's right. Come on. Contending no matter what the cost. This man has been indicted. He has lost fortunes. He's one of the only politicians in the country who's gone into office and left with less money than when he went in. All the others have enriched themselves. His came a great sacrifice. And all you can get upset about are his tweets and his past failures. That's it. Christian, you're you're justifying your morality by and, and posing it on someone who's in the arena by your apathy and inactivity. Unacceptable. Um, and and I I just would say to all of us, this is the most critical moment. And and God is looking to and fro for women and men of character who will do what's right. Because like Esther, you've been appointed for such a time as this. And, and all we want to do is go, gosh, I wish I had been born in another time. It's so awful. <laughs> Everything in your DNA was wired for this moment. Yep. And you're more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. And there's no whining in Christendom. Mm -mm. It's just, yes, Lord. And move forward. You're a conqueror. You, you're, you're, you have no spirit of fear anymore. No, no fear of man. For, for if God is for us, who can be against us? No one and nothing. No weapon fashioned against you will stand. You are more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. Not a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. And you know what love is? Greater love has no man than this than to lay down his life for a friend. Get in the gap and do what is necessary so that the world would know the truth and the truth would set them free. Amen. 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 Ooh, that's so good. We're going to have you pray in just a minute. I am thinking about all the moms listening to this. And, you know, I told my my adult kids, my, my youngest one, she's seven. She really wants to vote, you know, because we take her to city council. We're taking them all. We're just, you know, we're on for the ride here because we got we got some learning to do. But my oldest kids, you know, they were not, I wasn't actively engaged in this part of culture. And so now I just said, listen, you're, you guys are grounded for life if you do not vote. <laughs> and I said, you know, when it comes down to a party, you know, there's problems, right, on the party issue. And I said, but I do not vote party as much as you can kind of look at things and see where things land. I said, but I am voting for the one who will protect what matters to God. And what matters to God is life. Yeah. And what matters to God is the family, marriage between man and a woman. And I said, so that's what I'm rolling with. And I'm not voting for America's pastor. I'm yeah. voting for somebody who will protect what God esteems as the highest, his highest value is life. Amen. Yeah. It, I, I, I'll pray, but I, I, re, I remembered that I did not answer the question, YWLS, Young Women's Leadership Summit. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I share that. Uh, what you'd asked me to share was, 
the encouragement that it was in the 12 year history of Turning Point USA with my good friend, Charlie Kirk, it was, it's the largest uh, young women's leadership summit yet. And it was standing room only. And typically when you have sponsors come and speak, people leave the arena, nobody left. It was, it was, it was magical. And uh, each of the, the women, the speakers were asked to submit one of their recipes. So when you had the program and they would describe who the speaker was underneath, it was one of their recipes. And the program was put together like a cookbook. And the idea was returning to traditional values. And, and some people would find this horrifically offensive and on and on and on. But you're watching young women across the country unifying under this and they're thrilled by it and, and they can't get enough of it while the left with their secular progressive approach to what they think the family is, which is the destruction of the family. They can't even define gender and they're mutilating our children and, and they can't hold a family together in a nuclear family. And it's just a move towards communism. They're imploding and their house of cards is falling apart while, while the conservative movement is unifying under a call to return to traditional values. And the word conserve, conservative means you're conserving, conserving what? Those values the, from the moral law comes civil law, and the moral law is the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. One God, no idols, and it's real simple. There's one God. You just hold up a finger. One God. Two is no idols. You bend that finger. You don't bow down to idols. Three, you put your hand over your mouth. You don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Four, the, the, the four is honor the Sabbath day keep it holy. And then five, honor your mother and father. It'll go well with you. You'll live long on the earth. Six, don't murder. Seven, don't commit adultery. There's two in a marriage, not five. <laughs> Eight is don't steal because if you steal, they'll cut your thumbs off. And then this is don't bear false witness. It's five, not four or four, not five. And then 10 is don't covet. You memorize those, and from the moral law, every civil law decision will be established, and it will be the wise restraints that make men free. You remove the moral laws we've seen with the secular progressive left, and the civil law becomes weapons to enslave man and turn mm. them away from God. We are fighting for the freedom of mankind, and only the truth will set them free. And that's the return to traditional values. And I pray that there would be an awakening that we would instruct our children on those Ten Commandments, every decision we make, you wouldn't elect an official if they can't recite those 10 commandments. Because mm -hmm. how are they gonna legislate a civil law without understanding the moral law? That's it. Yeah. Wow, beautiful. This has been so powerful. Thank you so much. I'd love for you to pray for everybody listening because um, right. we're gonna need strength. We're gonna need courage. Amen. Well, Lord, so blessed to be with these ladies and I'm, I'm so grateful God for the fact that in a sea of humanity, uh, Lord, you you look and you you see those whose hearts are steadfast for you, and you say, "Okay, upon you I give this mantle." And Lord, it's not what we've done; it's what you've done, and we've been considered worthy in the sense that we would be a conduit for this great work. But Lord, please may man decrease that your spirit might increase. Let us never get in the way of this work that you're doing, God. We do pray for an awakening. And, and as J. Edwin Orr said, the foremost historian on revival, he said, revival's like judgment day. People awaken to the fact that they've abandoned the law of God and they see how far they've, they've fallen and they cry out. And Lord, we're seeing that happen now. Would you create an awakening across this country and a heart of repentance that we would return to the things of you and this, these wise restraints that would make us free, would bless us, Lord. The, the law doesn't save, but as Galatians 3 says, it's a school teacher to point us to Christ our Savior, until faith comes. And so, Lord, please, this nation conceived in liberty, dedicate the proposition that all men are created equal. Lord, please do not, we ask, let it perish from the face of the earth. Lord, we pray for an awakening and a revival and use all of these servants of yours for your glory. We pray, Lord, for a new birth of freedom, that this lighthouse of the gospel, 80 cents of every dollar in evangelism that comes from the United States of America would not be extinguished, but would burn fervently for years to come. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for joining us for Don't Mess With Our Kids. This has been so powerful. Make sure that you share this because there are people out there that need to hear this that never will without you using your voice, which is what this has been all about. So thank you so much. Thank you, Pastor Rob. Appreciate you, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Bless you guys.